Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of borders, language, culture, and here he is, winner of the National Radio Hall of Fame Award, Michael Savage. Being an American involves the embrace of high ideals and civic responsibility. We become the heirs of Thomas Jefferson by accepting the ideal of human dignity found in the Declaration of Independence. We become the heirs of James Madison by understanding the genius and values of the U.S. Constitution. Yeah, 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 it's hogwash. We become the heirs of Martin Luther King, Jr. by recognizing one another not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. This means that people of every race, religion, ethnicity can be fully and equally American. It means that bigotry or white supremacy in any form is blasphemy mm-hmm. against the American creed. <laughs> He's so blatantly <laughs> stupid. He's a punk. He's a dog. He's a pig. He's a con artist, a mutt who doesn't know what he's talking about, doesn't do his homework, doesn't care, thinks he's gaming society, doesn't pay his taxes. He's an idiot. Colin Powell said it best. He's a national disaster. He's an embarrassment to this country. It makes me so angry that this country has gotten to this point, that this fool, this bozo, has wound up where he has. He talks how he wants to punch people in the face. Well, I'd like to punch him in the face. Crazy time to be in the media, let me tell you. All right, so the big story of the day is that the bumbler comes back swinging at Trump. Bush opens up the uh, bumbling mouth and uh, uh, doesn't attack for eight years, says nothing about Obama, while Obama's dismantling America, flooding America with questionable immigrants, dismantling every aspect of America that is valuable, and the bumbler keeps his mouth shut. Now he comes out attacking Trump, calling him a bigot and this and that. And you say to yourself, are you shocked by this question? Which is, are you shocked by this? Are you are you surprised that uh, Bush comes out of nowhere to attack Trump? I am not. And let me tell you why I am not. Uh, when Bush was president, he had a, um, a meeting, a shindig, a party in the White House for a t- talk show host, conservative so-called. Limbaugh was invited. Hannity was invited. Others were invited. I was excluded. So I'm not surprised by the fact that he's a member of the deep state, as are some others in the media who pretend to be rock-ribbed conservatives. We're all conservatives. We're the good ones. Well, we're, we're the good ones. They're the bad ones. Why those liberals are the evil ones? It's we conservatives who are patriotic. <laughs> Laughing all the way to the bank. It's very hard for me to hold back on certain things that I know that I can't say, but I'm telling you as I sit here, The day is going to come in 2017 that you hear things that's going to make your hair stand up. When you find out what fraud there is on the right side of the aisle, your hair will stand up. But let's focus today on G.W. Bush attacking Trump. And there's some other things that are uh, on my mind that may not be related at all. Actually, they're not even related. If I tell you the questions I'm interested in, uh, you'll say they're not related, which they aren't. So here's one. Here's a guy, the guy who shot... Uh, How many people? Six people in Maryland. Oh, you didn't see that one? I'm sorry. He didn't look like Timothy McVeigh. Right, right. Didn't make it to the newspapers. Uh, After a 10-hour manhunt across state lines, authorities apprehended a man who shot six people in Maryland Wednesday, killing three. Radi Labib, Prince, was arrested Wednesday evening near a high school in Newark, Delaware. Now, if you read the story, you'll find out that Mr. Prince is not such a prince of a man. He had been arrested 42 times in Delaware. He was fired from a job earlier this year after punching a co-worker. A former employer tried to get a restraining order against Mr. Prince after he cursed and yelled at his boss, and everyone felt threatened. So Prince now goes on a shooting spree, even though he had been arrested 42 times in Delaware, which leads me to a big question today, which is should liberal judges who release 
felons who commit crimes, should the judges be held liable? Of course they should be. If a doctor, a surgeon, performs surgery, well, why do I have to say surgeon today? If a doctor does anything today, he's sued. People sue them for nothing. Uh, you went in for a headache and you didn't fix the headache, therefore you're a bad doctor. But let's make it more graphic. You go in for surgery and they cut the wrong artery or a vein and you have a, a problem, you sue the doctor. Malpractice, right? Sometimes a surgeon loses his license. Why shouldn't they judge be sued? Why should they be above the law? Who wrote that law? Why they wrote it. What is a judge but a lawyer who's politically oriented, who uses his cunning and his con to become a judge. How do you think they become judges? Because they're such brilliant jurists. So why should a judge be above the law? That's all I'm asking you. Of course, liberal judges and released criminals should be held liable. I'm asking you a rhetorical question. That's all. Here's another one that I want to get into. But play some music well, because I'm already losing the breath early on. I need the push-pull or something like it. Because I know you're not going to like the next story. I like that horn section. I like Okay, good. Take me a while to get back up to speed today. I am so angry today at the phonies on the right. I can hardly constrain myself. I want to say things. Now play the music. I can't take another day of it. All right, well, now we move to Israel mentally. Headline, AFP, hardline religious Jews protest against Israeli army service. Several thousand ultra-Orthodox Jews blocked a major intersection in central Jerusalem on Thursday to protest against efforts to force the religious Jews to enlist in the Israeli military like their secular compatriots. Now, let me explain something to you. If it wasn't for the military, there would be no Jews in Israel. Let's start with that. And for them to hide behind their religion and say that, how dare you tell us to serve in the military because we are engaged in religious study. Well, excuse me, you think the people in the military aren't engaged in their lives as well? So in other words, ultra-Orthodox young men are hiding behind their religion to dodge military service. More than 100 have been detained over the recent demonstrations, including 70 ultra-Orthodox uh, this week, blocking roads, sitting, sitting in the middle of the street. One of them had a sign that said, to a military prison for the crime of Torah study. One man who's a draft dodger in black robes and payas says, the state wants to silence all the Jews who want to study Torah. He said, lately they have, they have seen the ultra-Orthodox population growing, so they want us to serve in the army and be absorbed into the general population. Well, my friends, I have a question for you. You see, in Israel there's a law, and it requires men to serve two years and eight months in the military on reaching the age of 18, while all Israeli women must serve for two years. But ultra-religious men are exempt from military service if they're engaged in religious study. Mm. <laughs> religious study. Well, every Orthodox Jew is engaged in religious study because they read the Bible every day. So what, they get a pass? It's like people with disability placards on their cars in San Francisco. What, do you think they're all disabled? Are you joking? How many people have you seen jump out of cars in, in your town, hopping into the, into the IHOP? who have absolutely no disabilities whatsoever, and they use the blue, blue card that was put aside that space for the really cr crippled. I can ask you a question about Israel, but I'm not going to. I'm jumping to America. And here's my question for America. And you ready for it? Should the draft be restored in America due to all of the tensions in the world? I think it's an important question because I believe it's going to happen anyway. And the problem is when the millennials are drafted, and they're told to get up 5 o'clock in the morning uh, at Reveille, and they're sucking their thumb, and they have no iPhone, what are they going to do, cry in their beds and call their mother and say that they need a lawyer because they've been told to get up when they're not feeling well, that their safe space has been violated by the drill sergeant, that they don't feel good that morning, they don't want to go up on the, on the parade ground there. I'm telling you right now, unless we start training people through a draft, a compulsory draft, I don't know how we could ever fight and win a war again. I have no idea. Now, faced off against China, are you joking? Are you kidding me? Other than the very rednecks that the left hates, this country could be overrun in about three hours, by the way. Did you hear what I just said? Other than the 
white people and the black people who are in the military and the Hispanic hard guys who are in the military, this country can be overrun in three hours. Those are the very people that the liberals detest. They hate them. They call them every name under the sun. Even if they're not white, they're called terrible names because they're in the military. And I'm asking a very important question. Should the military be restored in the United States owing to the tensions in the world and the coming wars? Should liberal judges who release criminals be held liable? There's another one I'm going to do today because I saw an article about uh, royal blood and people. Everyone's into this uh, looking up their ancestry. I spit in the tube once. Nothing came back. I mean, because I'm an immigrant son, I mean, the records were lost. I don't know who my ancestors are. How do I know? I, you think I know who my ancestor was in 1236? How would I know? All I know is this. A lot of people live in their minds thinking that they're royal, of royal, you know, descent. And uh, I was reading an article that uh, a new study from the London School of Economics found that upper-class families took 300 to 450 years before their skions fell back into the middle class. And throughout society, poor families taken as a whole took an equal amount of time, 10 to 15 generations to work their way up into the middle class to just show you, to just show you how structured society is. Well, that's in England anyway, but not here in America. You've got a lot of people who move up from zero to a, a thousand in one generation, which is a wonderful part about America, which is why so many immigrants come here. Did you know that, for example, about 100 people of the Mellon family are alive today sharing $12 billion? That's the result of a bank that their forefather, Andrew W. Mellon, founded in the mid-1800s. So there's 100 of them left sharing $12 billion. Did you know that there are several hundred living members of the Rockefeller clan, and they're sharing $10 billion in wealth? That started when John D. founded Standard Oil in 1870. Did you know that? Did you know the Kennedy family's wealth of only a $1 billion? A billion dollars is all they're worth. A billion dollars. Can you believe it? That's all the Kennedy family is, is left with to live on. That's really hard to believe. I wonder how long it will take until those heirs of the Kennedys end up with a nail gun in their hand or driving a cab if they can even do that. So I was reading that story, and then it tied into um, people who say they've come back from the dead. There's a new study that says, that the brain remains conscious after we die. That's nice. I can't wait. to. That, that's wonderful. Just what we fear. You, you're dead. You're buried. You're in the coffin. Your brain is still alive. A nightmare. So I want to ask you something. Have you ever died and come back from the dead? Let's get the crazies calling the show today. 855-407-282 is the phone number. We're all over the map with really clear subjects. Draft, liberal judges, coming back from the dead. Uh, the CIA plant, George Bush attacking Trump. Are you shocked by Bush? Are you joking? He is the deep state. Limbaugh was invited. Hannity was invited. Savage was not invited. His wife, Laura, ran the, the book thing, Miss Librarian. I had one bestseller after another. She wouldn't even mention my books. I am not shocked by the Bush family. They are the establishment. They work hand in glove with the Democrats. They always have, which is why we didn't want Jeb to be president, which is why we took a chance on a businessman. You get it? I'll be back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. in the United States of America. I mean, we're basing it upon the religious Jews who don't want to serve in the Israeli military, even though U.S. Supreme Court, in, I'm sorry, the Israeli Supreme Court ruled this year saying they had to serve. Well, now they're rioting in Israel. Oy vey, why do we have to serve? Religious Jews. Come on. It wasn't the Torah that saved your ancestors. It was a Thompson submachine gun and a Sherman tank. And let me tell you something else, all you phonies out there who hide behind your, your Bibles. 
You want someone else to die so you could go re read a Torah somewhere? The most religious Jews in Israel also served in the military. I remember the time, by the way, that a famous chief rabbi of Israel, the chief rabbi of Israel, was a paratrooper. He wasn't afraid to fly with an Uzi in one hand and a Bible in the other. So stop hiding behind the Torah and saying you're so much better than everybody else. I'm sick of it. And the same thing goes on here. They're too good to do this. They're too good to do that. Let me tell you something else that you may have forgotten from your own religious teachings. Your own religious teachings teach you that a man should have a trade or an occupation for half the day and engage in religious studies the other half of the day. No one ever said you should be ex ex uh, let ex removed completely from the real world. Because if you are, you wind up removed from the real world. You don't know what you're talking about. How many poor Jews went into the ovens holding on to their precious Torahs? How many went into the ovens after their wives were killed in front of their eyes because they had no guns? And if they had a gun, they wouldn't know how to use it. What did they say? They're too good to use a gun? I'm sorry, it doesn't hold water. I agree a thousand percent with the Israeli Supreme Court, and you should force them into the military. It's that simple. Now it comes to America, the same story. A lot of people don't want to go in the military. Only people who want to go in the military are the people that Ellen DeGeneres, Rachel Madcow, and people like that hate. They put them down every day, one way or the other. The rednecks, in other words. The rednecks are the, are, are the heart and soul of America. They're the spine of America. So we need now to understand that China's threatening us. There are continuously growing threats in the Middle East, in case you haven't noticed. Maybe you have a wig on your mind and you don't really know what's going on. Maybe you're still listening to Mr. Ha Ha. Maybe it's all Ha Ha Ho Ho. Or maybe you still have your hat on backwards watching the idiots in the football game. Do you know what's really going on in the world? Do you know that the radical Islamic movement is getting stronger, not weaker? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. They were finally driven out of uh, the areas of Iraq and Syria, thanks to the Russian Air Force. I know I'm not supposed to say that, but for eight years, your friend, your hero, Barack Hussein Obama, made believe he was fighting ISIS. He was not fighting ISIS. Everybody knows that. It was only when Trump came along... And only when the Russian military started to bomb, the Russian Air Force, that the tide was turned. And yet the Libs want war with Russia because they're a fifth column. The liberal establishment is actually the fifth column. Fifth column, not the fourth estate. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE. Savage. Four minutes after the hour, you're listening to the one and only Savage Nation. Can I be attacked for that saying the one and only? The one and only, it's the one and only Savage Nation. That's all. Play the song, I'm not interested. Should liberal judges who release criminals be held liable? Uh, duh, yes. Can they be? Never. Because they write the laws, that's why they're judges. Should the draft be restored due to all the tension in the world? Uh, yes. Will it be? I don't know. Can it be in this political climate with all the hysterical uh, leftists out there who would say that they need a safe space and the mean drill sergeant told them to do something like get up in the morning and take a shower, cut their hair, take the nose ring out of their nose, call the ACLU? Why don't you just create an entire brigade of um, millennial snowflakes? and put them on the front lines and let them run the war the way they want. Let them fight the war any way they want. Give them their own leadership. Let Ellen DeGeneres be the general. Yeah, right, okay. It's no joke because this is going to happen anyway. And then I asked you about coming back from the dead. I threw it out there because I wanted crazy calls. You know, that. remember I told you yesterday I ended the show with a dream I had about the word sterile bull, sterile bull, sterile bull, sterile bull. I, sterile bull. I said, who was the sterile bull that I dreamed about? WNTW in Virginia. Phil, who do you think is the sterile bull of my dreams? Hey, Michael, how are you? The, the sterile bull, I believe, and I'm 
pretty tuned into this period of revelation in the Bible, so I feel like the facts I get in my brain come from God a lot of times through Jesus. And I believe the bull, my feeling would be that be Trump. He's like a raging bull, but he has no power, so he's sterile. He, no matter how, he looked so tough yesterday after what McCain said. He was so upset with McCain, but there's nothing he can really do as president because we're all at a time of revelation now. Jesus is going to come back. This is the period of testing time to see who the rebels are. That Jesus doesn't want in his kingdom. So, so Trump is a righteous leader, and every time you see somebody rebel, Michael, that means... Wait, wait, did you say, wait, Trump is a what leader? Sorry? You said Trump is a what leader? He's, a ster he's sterile. He's, a, he's the bull, but he's... No, but you said, did you say a racist leader? Did I hear that, or you didn't say that? <laughs> so I, I didn't say racist. I said he's a sterile, meaning he has no power. I don't know if somebody's putting things on my phone for I'm talking or not, but I'm saying he just has no power. Well, I wouldn't go so far as to say he has no power. I would say that McCain has too much power. I would say McCain. I would say McCain is a traitor. McCain is a turncoat. McCain is a Manchurian candidate. McCain is Doctor Strangelove. How did he come back from the living dead so fast? Where he had cancer, he was dying. Remember a few months ago, the scar is gone. Now he's healthier than a bull. How did that happen? How did he come back stronger than ever before? What was the cancer story, by the way? And what about Jimmy Carter also? When his book came out a few years ago, he was dying of cancer just before the book tour. Do you remember that one? Yeah, but what about every time they win the Academy Award and all of a sudden their spokesman for, for climate control, uh, global warming, or now the Dreyfus lady has cancer of her uh, breast cancer, but she's making a political statement that wouldn't it be great for everybody to have the same one government health system? Well, we don't well I don't know. You know, cancer's a terrible thing. But when you use cancer for political gain or any other disease for political gain, it makes me very upset. All right, Phil, I'm going to send you a copy of God, Faith, and Reason when it comes out on November 14th, God, Faith, and Reason. Oh, boy, what's going to happen when that comes out? Can you imagine the ridicule? Can you imagine what the fifth column is going to say when that book comes out? Nothing. Nothing. WABC, Gerald. Line number six is calling about the uh, draft story in Israel. You have the floor, Gerald. Go ahead, please. Hello? Gerald, you're on the radio. Talk yes, talk, Gerald. Yes. Uh, the Zionist government had forced over a million Sephardic Jews to become unreligious using the army. It is almost impossible to be religious in the Israeli army. The Orthodox are going to take over the country eventually because they have more children, and they want to stop that. So they want right, to Gerald, Gerald, let me ask you, who's going to protect the Orthodox when they take over the country if they won't lift up arms? Who's going to defend them? No, they will. They'll set up an army that's not anti-religious. This army... Wait, 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 wait. So you're saying the only re reason that the yeshiva brachas won't go in the military is because... They're afraid of losing their, their religion, their religious uh, uh, orientation? That's one of the main reasons. Yeah, I mean, so you mean, are you, tell, are you telling me in Israel right now they don't have special units for ultra-Orthodox? They're a little better than the 50s. They forced over a million Sephardic Jews to become unreligious in the 50s, and that's what they want to do. Because well, that's why Israel's still around. That's why the that's why Israel's still around because they they told them to put down the the, the Bible and pick up a gun to defend themselves. Otherwise, they'd be, they'd be going into an oven again with their friendly oh. Arabs around them. Oh. That's why they're still able to study the Torah because of the guns and the airplanes and the tanks and the weapons. Otherwise, there'd be no Jews there. There would be just like they had Jews in the early 1900s before they had. They had half a million Jews living together with the Arabs for better and for worse. So you would like to see no state of Israel. Are you an anti-Zionist uh, Jewish man? Are you an anti-Zionist Jew? No, I'm a religious man, Russian descent, who went to public school. And? and I how, does it, how does it make sense? How does it make sense for an entire group of people in Israel to not want to serve in the military when without the military there would be no Israel? How does that make sense? Because by the... So Torah-learning Jews are the ones who keep the Jewish people going. Look what uh, Okay, fine. Hold it. You have, no, you have no argument with me. You, you can do both. You can do both. You don't have to do one or the other. They are, not, they are not mutually exclusive. 
How about the chief rabbi of Israel who was a paratrooper? How did that work out? He was almost excommunicated by the very, very big rabbis. Well, so the big rabbis are the problem. No, they because they because they lose what because they lose their 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 um the worshippers in their communities. Is that it? They lose their power without looking at what they're doing to the nation as a whole. Could Israel survive without a military? In your opinion, no military at all. Say something. Look what the Holocaust. No, and no, 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 sir, Gerald. Could stop for a minute. Could Israel survive as a nation without a military at all? If God wants it to, it will. You know, stop with if God wants it to for one minute. I'm, not. You know, I'm asking Gerald to use his power of reason. If Israel had no military, could it survive? If the military was set up along the Torah... We can't answer. This is the problem with religious fanatics. It's, it doesn't matter whether they're Muslims, Jews. It doesn't matter. Religious fanatics in any religion are the same. Their minds shut down. That's it. They can't think. They go back to the doxy, and that's the end of it. Doxy, period. Doxy, doxy. Now, you ask yourself, look, if you feel that way, say, how do you write a book, God, Faith, and Reason? How? How? If you had any idea what it does to me to have to deal with these questions, uh, you'll see it in the book. I've been dealing with it all my life. All right, let's talk about other stuff because I could see I'm not going to get anywhere. Look, the fact is the uh, Israeli Supreme Court ruled on this, and they said, you can't hide behind the religion anymore. You're serving. So now they're rioting because they, they had a good thing going. They sat and studied all day long. They, they, they prayed. They didn't have to work. Uh, all they had to do was study, and they say, we want exemption. Well, the Israeli people said it's not fair. If my son is serving, my daughter's serving, you're going to serve. They didn't like it, but the Supreme Court ruled that you have to serve. So now they're protesting and rioting because all of a sudden they don't like having to do what the other people do. Well, I will rem remind you again, common sense would dictate without a military there'd be no Israel. Everybody knows that. Common sense dictates that. All right, so let's go back to the other stories. In America, should we restore the draft? Yes or no? I mean, you're going to have I guarantee you it's going to come anyway. If, God forbid, there's a blowout with a big nation like China, God forbid, I don't know how we survive. Can you imagine when they have so many millions of extra men in China who have virtually no reason to live and they're as hard as, as trees facing off against a pot-smoking American boy, 18 years old? Can you imagine that? What would happen? Well, you better imagine it because it's a nightmare. 855-407-282 is the phone number. David on WABC is again calling on that question. I know it's a sensitive question. David, go ahead. You're on the issue of religious and army, yes? Yeah. Um, to be in the army in Israel, it's not possible for someone to keep the, the level of religious observance that they're doing. The way it's structured, the way the, the, the generals, the leaders, the people in power... The way it's designed, it's not designed to be an environment conducive for religion. If it would, no, it's an environment conducive to killing your enemy. That's correct. That's true. It is an environment conducive to killing your enemy. But if they would also, it's not. It's not. Of course, an, ar an army is an environment conducive to killing your enemy. But this army, in addition, there is an agenda there. You know, here is the problem with the ultra orthodox community, so far as I can tell. It's based upon 18th or 19th century Poland not upon the world in which they live today. When you were living in a shtetl somewhere in the Pale of Settlement, you could have such delicious arguments in poverty, and you could argue day and night over on the head of a pin how many angels there are. But the history that we're living through now dictates something quite different, doesn't it, David? You know and I know that, was there, that had there been no army, there'd be no Israel. So are you another anti-Zionist Jewish person? No. I agree with you 100% that the army is necessary, but it can be done. There are many ways that they could, they could be much more accommodating. The fact is they want, like the previous caller said, to make the people irreligious. If they would have it more accommodating, people would be much more open to it. I have a friend who's in the American army, and he told me it's, it's a whole different story. I mean, the, 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 the tolerance, there is no agenda. There is no... There is no... Uh, so, so the ultra-Orthodox Jew believes there's an agenda in Israel to destroy their religious beliefs, and it has nothing to do with defending Israel. That's a very clever argument. If you go... That's something, that's something only a lawyer could come up with. It's 
true. If you go to Israel, go. Go yourself. See what they're saying. See what the politicians are saying. How the, 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 they don't want. It's not what they want. They want, they want to change it. And if, the, if, the, if they would produce... So, in other words, they want the military to accommodate their religious practices. I understand that. Uh, how does that work when you have to defend your nation? Tell me how that works. For thousands of years of Jewish people... Have, have given no, 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 wait, hold on. Let's, let's be realistic for a minute. Let, let, please, for one minute. Stop for one minute. Thousands of years ago, let's go back to the desert together. When Israel was a band of tribes and King David came along and killed all of the other tribal leaders to amalgamate the tribes into one nation. He, killed, he did it through blood. Did you know that? Are you aware of that? Um, he didn't. Are, are you aware that King David was a bloodthirsty, in essence, the equivalent of a, a narco-terrorist of his time? Uh, no, he wasn't. What do you mean, no, he wasn't? It's well-known historical fact that he killed all the other tribal leaders. You're not telling me that's not real, are you? If you want to go through Samuel and you want to go through kings... If you want See, to you don't know history. Again, you're modifying the truth. The ancient Israelites were all warriors, or there would not have been Israel at all. They had an army. Yeah, they had an army, and it, and it, was, it was a million times more conducive to being religious than the army is today. That's what do you mean being religious? What are you talking about? Yes. A million times more to being religious. What does that actually mean? They had to pick up a spear, they had to pick up a sword, and they had to put down their Bible. What, what do you mean more, more, more tolerant? No, I agree. Let me explain what I mean a million times more religious. Do you know that the units in Israel, a lot of them, the, 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 the mix between the, the, the female soldiers, the men, the promiscuity, which goes on, it's... Oy vey, oy vey, a boy should see a girl. That's a horrible thing. Okay, listen, listen. All right, we're gonna we're gonna move on. I got it. I got it. There's no talking. No talking. No, t I can't go to New York now. I'll be stoned to death. If I if I walk near seven seven seven, they'd stone me to death for being blasphemous. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now eight five five four hundred Savage eight five five four hundred seven two eight two Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call eight hundred two eight nine twenty six forty six or SwissAmerica dot com. Um. <laughs> Hey, look, before we get back to uh, the business at hand, I want to tell you some good, solid c career advice that I learned long ago, and it's true. You dress for the job you want, not the job you have, whether you're dressing for work or dressing to go out. People do notice the clothing that you wear. It's why I wear Charles Tirrett. We all love quality clothes, but until now, your options were brutal. It was either high quality, ridiculously overpriced shirts, or you could get affordable, out-of-style shirts that wrinkle the minute you put them on. CT shirts are the best shirts that I own. They're British styled using the softest fabrics. They're the most exquisitely tailored, crafted, crease-free shirts I've ever worn. Tie or no tie, tucked or untucked, you'll get the compliments that you want in a CT shirt. And I got you a special deal. One CT shirt normally costs 100 bucks, But now you'll get three shirts for just $99. That's 60% off. And CT shirts come with free delivery, a six-month quality guarantee, and free returns. 99 bucks for three amazing CT shirts. But you must hurry and go to ctshirts slash ctshirts.com slash savage. Write it down, ctshirts.com slash savage. That's ctshirts.com slash savage. I got to take a quick call from an ex-Israeli soldier and see what he has to say. Hey, Al, line six. Hey, Al, what, what do you think about the ultra-religious saying that they shouldn't serve in the military in Israel? All right, uh, sir. Uh, thank you for having me on. Uh, so the thing, I, I personally served in the military. I grew up in Israel, and I moved to the United States a few years back. Um, first, the most important, I listened to the other guys that you were just interviewing. They're lying to you. There is a special ultra-Orthodox unit in the Israeli military simply for very, very religious people to serve. So, and oh, okay, so they already have a special unit where they can do their thing and not be exposed to women. Absolutely, and, and I'm talking about, I served back in the 80s and 90s, which means it, it's been there at, at least since then. So everything. So in, in other words, he's making up a story that if they go in, they're going to be exposed to things they don't want to be exposed to, and they're going to lose their ultra-religious practices. You're saying that's not true. Let me add and say, there is tons, 
of religious Jews who proudly serve in the Israeli military. It's those with the, with the, with the payah, those with the black and white. These are the only religious Jews who do not and refuse to serve. Right, so it's the Satmar Hasidim who won't serve, but the Chabadniks do serve, don't they? I, I'm not sure necessarily about Chabadniks. Yeah, I think the Chabadniks do serve, and it's the Satmar anti-Zionist Jews who don't want to serve. They want to live off the fat of the land and let someone else take a bullet. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, the Savage Nation, home of borders, language, culture, and here he is, winner of the National Radio Hall of Fame Award, Michael Savage. I don't know, this week is dragging, dragging, something's wrong, there's something wrong out there. So now we're dealing with the other issues. Now it's no, it's not fun and games now. Now Bush comes out, the globalist, Bush the globalist, uh, who wanted his son, the next son to be president. It wasn't, enough, it wasn't enough that the family had, what was a 12 years, they wanted what, 12 and 8, a 20 year job. They wanted two decades as a dynasty running America and they're, not forgiving of Trump. They're not forgiving of any of us who voted for Trump. They hate nationalism. They're calling it nativism. That's an interesting one. They're making believe that you could be a nationalist, but you can't be a nativist. What, what does that mean? What, what exactly does that mean? So I'm not shocked by Bush coming out against Trump because, as I said to you before, and I'll repeat it till you actually hear me, those of you who are interested in these the minutiae of talk radio, when Bush was president, GW, they had meetings, they had this, that, they invited some talk show hosts to a big soiree. Rush Limbaugh proudly went and boasted about it. I think Mr. Hannity was invited, boasted about it, good friend of Bush, as he is of Mr. Trump. I was excluded. Why was I excluded? I had one best-selling conservative title after another. Why was I excluded? Because I wasn't the type that could easily be bamboozled by, by looking at a picture of George Washington's uh, wooden teeth and being fed, you know, some bad Chardonnay. In the, over, in the dining room. So they didn't invite me, that's all. They don't like mavericks, and they don't like people who think for themselves. That is true in any country on earth. So here we are in radio. We're talking about different topics. And the one that caught fire today was the issue of Israel, where the ultra-Orthodox are rioting, sitting down. They don't want to go in the military, even though the Supreme Court said they have to. And I had a lot of calls saying, no, they don't want to go in because the, uh, they're exposed to uh, a way of life that's an antithetical to their Bible studies. They don't want to be around women. They don't want to be exposed to this, to that, to cursing, which I understand. But I was saying there must be ultra-Orthodox units in the military. And the one guy said, no, there isn't. And some people are saying, of course there are. And it leads us to America now, which is should the draft be restored in America before it's too late? You have to build in advance of your need not when you need it. If it wasn't for Winston Churchill seeing what was coming in the 30s, if Winston Churchill did not take Hitler seriously in the 30s and almost secretly rearm Britain, Britain would the British would be speaking German right now, which might be better than them speaking Arabic, which will happen in 20 years. But that's a separate story. And that was a joke incident. Don't, don't take me literally now and try to crucify me with it. The point is, is that Winston Churchill saw the winds of war before they actually hit Britain, and he secretly rebuilt the British military, and thank God he did because they had the, the great Spitfire fighter plane. Had they not had that in the Battle of Britain, the Germans would have defeated the Air Force, the Royal Air Force, and, and then there would have been an invasion of Britain, and Britain would have fallen to the Germans. And it was all because of Churchill that they were not invaded and overtaken. So he saw ahead, and he planned ahead. Well, I'm su suggesting we think ahead and plan ahead. And I'm saying we restore the draft. That's all. So that, that's a big question. I'm sure it's been talked about before. 
But since we're talking about Israel and God and we're talking about Orthodox Jews who don't want to serve and some do, I'm going to read you page 16 from my forthcoming book, God, Faith, and Reason. It won't be painful. It's only a paragraph long. I want you to see what a secular man has to say on this issue. And I wrote this, and it's on page 16. I said that I once met a rabbi who concluded that God is in fact not omnipotent, but only omnipresent, meaning we do have we do have free will and control our own destinies. And I write, yes, there are things encoded in us, encoded in us, perhaps through genetics, perhaps through faith that we cannot control. Perhaps we are born for certain faiths, but within the parameters of these genetic or predetermined destinies, we have wide latitude, and that is why we need the guidebook called the Holy Bible. Notice what I said, and that is why we need the guidebook called the Holy Bible. And then on page 16 of my book, I put a biblical quote. This is the beauty of this book. There are actual Old Testament quotes throughout set up an old typeface, and it, I, I quoted Isaiah 41.10 where, where he wrote, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I strengthen thee, yea, I help thee, yea, I uphold thee with my victorious right hand. You say, well, that's interesting. So that's a secular book, and I say pre-order God, Faith, and Reason. There's a link to, to Amazon. And yes, I am selling you a book, yes. Yes, I do want it to take off, yes. No, I want it to fail. No, I want the book to flop. I've had four or five New York Times bestsellers in a row. This is the biggest chance I've ever taken. Ultra-Orthodox Mount, Day of Rage Against Army Draft. A bunch of no-goodniks. A bunch of spoiled no-goodniks. Without the military, there'd be no ultra-Orthodox in Israel. There'd be nothing. They'd be walking around on their hands and knees, begging for their lives. What are they doing here? What are they doing? What kind of people are these that they're so insane and disconnected from reality? What do you mean a day of rage against the army draft? How about your, your secular Jewish compatriots who, whose sons go in the military and their daughters? What are you talking about? And then we're talking about afterlife. I, I have to work that in right now. I'm sorry. There was an article that I saw about the afterlife. I was going to do, do gluten hysteria explained. Now, don't get me wrong. There are people who are gluten sensitive who die and get really sick and can die. if They have celiac disease. But... Actually, I'm going into it now because one of the chief scientists who provided key evidence of gluten sensitivity amongst non-celiac disease individuals, this scientist recently published follow-up papers that show the opposite. And the paper came out last year, not in the New York Post, but in the journal Gastroenterology. And he studied up his, his original study, and he found that only 1% of Americans, about 3 million people, actually suffer from celiac disease, but 18% of stupid American adults now buy gluten-free foods. And what's worse yet is you see the mothers feeding their children gluten-free. Everyone's gluten-free. Idiots. They're paying more, and they're denying the child primarily important nutri nutrients. They don't even know what gluten is, but they know it's, it's, the new, it's the new bugaboo. Gluten, 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 gluten. They don't even ask what gluten is. It's like the idiots that tell you they're vegans. They don't even know why. Gluten. What is gluten? It's a protein found in any normal diet. I've said this to Middle Easterners or Mexicans. They laugh at me. They work how stupid can Americans be. You go to a Central American country. You go to Mexico or Central America. What is the primary foodstuff of that, of that region? What do they make every morning? What do they make? They take wheat and they roll it and they dough it. And then they heat it on a hot stone. They eat it. A piece of hot bread, in other words. You go to the Middle East, what are the Arabs eating? What do they eat every day, going back thousands of years, if they could get it? They Wheat, by the way. Wonderful. They love it. And what do they make? They make a bread. Every day they need a piece of bread. What kind of stupidity is this that people think bread is now their enemy? Their worst enemy on earth is now a piece of bread. I've heard all the other stuff. Like, well, the wheat then isn't the same as wheat now. That's the clever answer. No, it is the same wheat. Yeah, I know. Monsanto poisoned the wheat. Therefore, you can't eat wheat without dying. So the scientists who came up with this hysteria went back and tested 37 identified, self-identified gluten-sensitive patients. And what happened was the subjects were cycled through high gluten, low gluten, and no gluten, meaning placebo diets. And they didn't know which diet plan they were on at any given time. And guess what happened? In the end, all of the treatment diets, even the placebo diet, the placebo diet, which had no gluten, 
All of them caused pain, bloating, nausea, and gas to a similar degree. And it didn't matter if the diet contained gluten. So what's that about? Uh, it wasn't the gluten causing the reaction. It was called mind over matter, psychosomatic illness, in other words. I've studied this in great detail when I was a, well, let's say when I was in biosciences. The psycho, you know, the, the mind-body connection is awesome. The mind can kill, the mind can heal. You know that in your own life. That's all. Next case, move on. What do you want to talk about? I don't, you want to die, talk about after you die, do you come back? I, I, ugh, God, I want to talk about that one. If I get up in the morning, every morning, and I'm going to give you one man's example. I get up every day at dawn, no matter when I go to sleep. I have double curtains, triple curtains, any light cracks through. I'm such a natural human being. I'm such a, a, a doctor. A, um, I'm thinking of Zorba. I'm Zorba-like. I'm so much like Zorba the Greek, even though I'm not a Greek. Any light cracks through the curtain, I get up. I get up, I let the dog out, I do my thing, and then I want to go back to sleep because I don't really want to be up at 5 o'clock. My show doesn't start on the West Coast for seven hours. Who needs it to face the world in the dark? So what I do is I go back to sleep to try and get you know a little rest, one more hour. And in that hour, what happens is my mind turns on me. I start seeing the, the death, the crypt, horrible and tragedy, and I get out of bed and go right to the news. I go right to the computer and look at the news and all my problems <laughs> go away. So I don't really want to face these questions right now, but we, we sort of do and we push them away, right? Have any of you out there actually died and come back from the dead? It's a quick, a quickie. At 34 minutes after the hour, I have my good friend Laura Ingram back on the show for a short visit to tell us how her book tour is going. She told me she met a lot of my sav- uh, of sa- a lot savage fan, a lot of savage fans along the way. They love this show, and because she was on this show last week when a book was launched, they all came up to talk to her and buy her book. That was nice. So we're having her back, and we'll talk to Laura Ingram for a while, and we'll take your calls on all these topics. And this whole thing about the Florida congresswoman, what a story that turned out to be. You know the one with the cowboy hat? Florida Democrat Wilson, turns out, voted down virtually every bill that would have supported veterans and their families, according to votesmart.org. And by the way, this site has founding board members, which include Jimmy Carter and Gerald Ford. It's very measured. So this woman, this big mouth, this woman who criticized our president for being insensitive toward the widow of a U.S. soldier slain in Africa is now subject, and rightly so, to criticism herself because she opposed bills that could have ensured that families of four soldiers slain in Afghanistan, for example, received death and burial benefits. She is an anti-military, anti-American, far-left radical activist who I think is a liar down to the straw in her cowboy hat. Other than that, I have no strong opinions about her. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. You know, yesterday there was this fake scandal of Trump said something insensitive. He really didn't. It's all a matter of what he meant. And, of course, he didn't mean to insult anyone. But didn't prevent the uh, esteemed congresswoman from Florida, a far-left anti-American hater, in my opinion, from trying to categorize Trump as a, a insensitive racist man. Well, today John Kelly, his chief of staff, a former uh, and very distinguished Marine general, and a man who gave all you can give to this country because his son, you see, died in the military in Afghanistan. He gave it all. Listen to what John Kelly, General Kelly, one of America's greatest men, says today about Trump compared to that creature with the straw hat. Let's hear it. It stuns me that a member of Congress would have listened in on that conversation. Absolutely stuns me. And I thought... At least that was sacred. You know, when I was a kid growing up, a lot of things were sacred in our country. Women were sacred. 
and looked upon with great honor. That's obviously not the case anymore, as we see from recent cases. Life, the dignity of life, was sacred. That's gone. Religion, that seems to be gone as well. Gold Star families, I think that left in the convention over the summer. But I just thought the selfless devotion that brings a man or woman to die on the battlefield, I just thought that that might be sacred. And when I listened to this woman and what she was saying and what she was doing on TV, the only thing I could do to collect my thoughts was to go and walk among the finest men and women on this earth. And you can always find them because they're in Arlington National Cemetery. And you can't even say anything after this. I mean, there's almost nothing you could say to follow that up. Now, Mr. Kelly is a retired Marine Corps general. He's the real McCoy. He is the right stuff. His son died in Afghanistan, and he thought that it was sacred. A president calling a Gold Star family thought that was sacred. But it didn't prevent this esteemed uh, congresswoman from Florida from listening in and trying to mischaracterize the call. You know, those of you who don't know the difference between character and no character, I think you can pretty much see it here. There's no way to turn this against Trump or against General Kelly unless you're really sick in the head. Unless you're really sick in the head and so bent that you don't know which way is up anymore, you, there's nothing you can do here but say, you know what, she was wrong, Trump did the right thing, and let's get over it. So now we find that um, Bush comes out and attacks Trump. That We played a little of that, but you haven't heard it all yet. And, you know, I keep saying I'm not shocked because I know who Bush was. He's a globalist. They may, his father was actually a much better president than he was. We all know that as well. His father was a pilot in World War II. His father, the original Bush, was the head of the CIA. He's the old guard. The, the father Bush, the first Bush, remember the movie The Good Shepherd? Raise your hand. You kind of remember. It was a great movie. Matt Damon was in it. And um, there was a great telling line in that. It was about the, the forming of the original formation of the CIA, going all the way back to the OSS. And there's a great, great passage. It was written by some of the brightest screenwriters in Hollywood history. I hope they're still around. So there's a great telling uh, argument or discussion between the Joe Pesky Italian character and uh, the Matt Damon old guard Anglo-Saxon establishment character. And Pesky says to him, Something along the lines, the Jews have their religion, the black people have their music, or something like that. He said, but what do you people have, meaning the wasps? And the Matt Damon character says, the nation. That said it all to me. And there still is an old guard in this country that does run the nation. God knows where they are, who they are, how they are. You can't mischaracterize all of them as the deep state of the swamp. You just can't do it. You'd be wrong to overgeneralize about some of these loyalists who have been in power and their families have been in power since the Mayflower. Don't underestimate them either. But I'm not so sure that Bush Jr. was really from the right stuff, by the way. I think his father was closer to the right stuff. And for them to come out of the woodwork and attack Trump shows me that this Bush is the wrong stuff. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE. Gluten hysteria explained. Should the draft be restored due to all attention in the world? Should liberal judges who release criminals be held liable? These are some of the uh, questions that we are talking about. But I haven't gotten to the, I think, the most esoterically weird and interesting question, which is I read that when people die, their brain energy stays alive for a number of minutes after we're dead. That's nice to think about as they're putting you in the, in the, in the, in the box and your brain is still screaming, let me out of here. Please, let me out of here. I remember when I was a kid, I saw the most, there was an Alfred Hitchcock Presents series long time ago. And I used to watch it religiously. I think it was every Wednesday night. It was a short 30-minute show. And each one was crafted like magic. So there was one where there was a character played by an actor named Joseph Cotton, I believe. Fabulous actor of his time. Where a man, a mean person, a very mean person who doesn't believe in God, doesn't believe in anything, as it was written, is 
uh, he gets in an accident, and he's dead. He's he's in the um, I think he's in the uh, the operating room or so. No, where the, the the mortuary, the mortuary, and. He was a man who had no feelings. He was a hard-hearted man with no feelings. That's how it was written. See, they wrote play stories in those days. They all had a moral core to them, which is why people remain somewhat moral in America until the vermin of Hollywood came along, the sick drug addicts that we know of today who don't even know which way is north, never mind which way is up. So anyway, as the story was written, comes to the end. He gets into an auto wreck. They haul him into the um, hospital mortuary or whatever they call it. They're going to perform an autopsy on him. And just before the doctor takes the scalpel and is about to cut him open, one tear comes running down his eye. And the doctor says, oh, my God, he's still alive. Now, they said it was a moral play. But, you know, it was. A, I never forgot that particular thing. I often worried about it. I often worried about it. Like, what if we're not really? You know what I'm saying? What if? What if all the religious people are right? That our soul does hover over the dead body? You know, this is a good question for the Orthodox people because I tell you, um, I've, I've buried a brother and two parents. It's not pleasant to think about, but it's the way of all flesh. And before we get back to this topic, which I'll, I'll continue with in this half hour if you want to talk about that, my good friend Laura Ingram has just arrived from Somewhereville with her book, Billionaire. Uh, at the barricades. Laura, thank you for calling. Welcome to the program. Where are you, Laura? Oh, I just got back to Washington, Michael, but I have to say, when I was off doing stuff for the book, which hit the New York Times bestseller list, I just, I just found out. Um, when, when I was out doing stuff for the book in Arizona and Vegas, especially in Arizona, because Vegas was a private event, I had so many of your fans come up to me in line and say, I heard you on Michael Savage's show. Are you going to have him on your TV show? And I said, I looked, I looked at this one woman who was so funny. I said, duh, of course we're going to have him on show. She said, <laughs> Laura, let me tell you something. If, 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 and I say if, and I, I swear to you, if, if it happens wonderful, if it doesn't, I'll still love you. Laura, if and when I appear on your show, if you have me on, of course I'll do it. If you're not blocked by higher authorities or powers, God knows what goes on there. It will be the first time I've been on major television in 15 years. Do you know that? Well, that's a joke. I mean, no, well, you you know I'm black a black ball, but you'll have an audience. You'll you'll have the biggest numbers in in Fox News current Fox News history that day. I can guarantee it. Well, well, Michael, I don't. I mean, I want to have great numbers, and I think I will. But you're just one of the best storytellers. You're you're just one. You're so talented, and you know when I say that, I mean it. I'm not one of those people who give false flattery for fun. That's no, no. I, why do you think I, I revere you so much? Because I know you're a straight shooter. No, and I don't. I don't. You know, I don't. I just don't be a. Oh, this is too schmaltzy, Laura. This is a too much of I love you. You know, we got to stop. We got to watch out here. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Oh so, God. Laura, how is the book tour going? It's it's fun. You know, I think a lot of people are trying to figure out why there's so much turmoil uh, post. Trump election, people, a lot of people still don't really get, you know, well, what, how did this happen? And I'm trying to explain it to people. Look, the establishment drove our country into a ditch, okay? The, the Democrats with the Clintons and the Obamas, the Bushes with the Bush dynasty, and they all agree with each other on, on critical issues. They're in much, much greater agreement with each other, meaning the Bushes and the Clintons, than, 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 you know, then they're in agreement with us. I mean, they, they're a cabal of a dynastic sort that believes that, you know, b borders, language, culture, the things that you talk about, they're kind of outdated. I mean, they're fine as, as far as they go, but when, when they need to... Laura, you, you heard what GW said about Trump today, didn't you? It was shocking, wasn't it? Yeah, well, it, and it, it was shocking and, and it wasn't. You know, it, 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 we, we saw the great takedown of Jeb Bush and a total repudiation of Bushism in 2016. And they're called the establishment for a reason. They, they are established. They're not going to go down without a fight. And, and I'm actually surprised it took them this long to drag out old poor old W. Bush. I mean, they couldn't even, they couldn't even invite him to the convention. The last, the last two conventions, mm -hmm. the Bushes haven't even been, been featured. Think about that. He's a, he's a well, look, Laura, I was funny. I was just talking about the, the, uh, the movie The Good Shepherd for many years ago, played by Matt Damon, one of the early CIA operative. And it was about the old WASP establishment that still runs America. I believe it's true, don't you? 
Well, I think that I think that whatever you want to call them, I mean, I think there's people who are have no faith. I think there are people who, you know, from all different walks of life. But this is this is a cabal that got really rich and really powerful off a status quo that deindustrialized the country, and and completely deep six the notion of a, of an independent America. They 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 did really well. I mean, they 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 got powerful. They got powerful positions in corporate America and in politics. And they're all friends. They all get along, and they think we're a bunch of Bulgarians. And so Trump, Trump. Well, but Laura, come on! You're a member in good standing of of that particular group of people. How? Why have they? I'm not. How do you? No, I'm not. No, no. I'm, don't get me wrong. I'm not. I'm not trying to put you in a place that you don't want to be. But you come from a background like that, don't you? No, I come from a working class you know, background and. In Glastonbury, Connecticut, where my dad was a, my dad was a, you know, an, a, 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 owned a car wash. My mom was a waitress, so she was seventy-four years old. I, I don't know. I always thought you were like a high-class person who came from the blue blood line, yeah. like from the Mayflower. <laughs> oh, yeah. well, my father's. I think my father's family, somewhere along the line, had a had a tannery in Boston. I think they <laughs> they lost. No, I, always, I always like said, oh, Laura Inger must have come over on the Mayflower. Her, her ancestors. Yeah, I'm glad to hear he only only owned the car wash. I feel less intimidated. Yeah, no, no. It, it was it, so. So the, this establishment cabal was upended by the populist surge in 2016, and they finally had someone who would stand on stage and call out Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton for what they for what they were in that second debate, what Trump did. And they also had someone who would call out the Bushes. I mean, George Bush left office, Michael, with a 29% approval rating. 29%. He so wait, but your book is called Billionaires at the Bar- Your book is called Billionaires at the Barricades. How does that fit into this discussion? Billionaire, billionaire, singular, at the barricades, meaning Trump. Trump's at the barricades. He has the media against him. He has the GOP establishment against him. He has the Democrat uh, establishment led by Obama and Clinton against him. He has uh, he has the globalist uh, regime at the UN and so forth against him. So he has all these barricades in front of him, and he has to build a barricade. He has to build a wall. So I use that as a metaphor because of everything that he's going to have to confront in order to be. Yeah, but Laura, you know the inside better than I do. He also has people in his own inner circle who are basically opposed to his original stated policies during the campaign. Am I right? Yeah, he has he has some people who are not, you know, solid conservative populist economic nationalists for sure. Uh, but I, I think you can see. I mean, let's just look on the trade, on the trade stuff he's doing. I mean, the the things that are happening with with our trade policy that, of course, the lazy media they don't report them. And I'm actually kind of glad they're not reporting them because because they're so transformative. This is going to completely change the current dynamic we have with settling all these companies abroad. And this is happening right as I speak, with the U.S. trade rep, Bob Lighthizer, with Wilbur Ross, even Vaughn. Some of these names people don't know. They are the architects, the modern-day architects of a new economic nationalism that will, will ensure that we do have trade, but our trade will be geared toward the American worker and the betterment mm-hmm. of the American family. That's the way it always was supposed to be. But when the Bushes yep. came along, it was, you know, they turned it all upside down. No wonder they're attacking Trump in the most uh, kind of icy, you know, a vicious way. It's very vicious. So billionaire, billionaire at the barricades. You're starting your new TV show on when? October thirtieth. October thirtieth, Monday. Yep. Well, but you've been on Fox for years. It's not you're not frightened of it, are you? Are you, you got any jitters? But it's a no. But it's a different. Yeah, I'm always a little. I was a little nervous starting something new. But you know, I have hosted shows for them before. But you know, just subbing in for other people. Um, but it's a it's a it's a new schedule for me. It's a late you know it's a late show. It's uh, you know, well, what time would you be on in the evening on the East Coast on Fox? Ten until eleven. Ten p.m. till eleven. So so on on the West Coast it's seven o'clock. I I'll, I'll still be up to watch the show. No, it's an awesome, I, and I can't wait to have you on. And we're gonna have we're gonna have a really interesting conversation about the America you grew up in. Wow. Um, with- how long How long has it been, Laura, since you've seen me per- in person? Uh, I haven't seen you for a couple of years. My son is talking to me when I'm on the I'm when I'm on the. <laughs> I love this. Oh, oh, didn't I see you with your kids at my swimming pool in Florida years ago? Yes, that was fun. That was a, that was incredible. You're, we, that we was a long time ago. So you you saw me pre ponytail, right, Laura? You saw me pre ponytail, right? I saw you with Trump. 
off at, the, at Mar-a-Lago not too long Oh, ago. right, but I had a ponytail then. That's right. You, we were at the same table. Right, right, right. Well, I cut the ponytail off. You know that. I have no ponytail anymore. I, I blend right in with the average Joe. I look like the average Joe now. No, no, I didn't like the ponytail. That wasn't. I'm not a ponytail. <laughs> no, I'm saying I'm telling you to put you at ease. No, you don't have to worry. A hippie, a hippie-looking man is not appearing on your show. Oh no, no. Now that I cut, no, now that I cut the ponytail off, I again hate all older men with ponytails. I think they're ugly. Oh my God! It's the thing. The thing about it is. You're you're going to be one step away from getting an ear spear and a bull ring on your nose. You know that's what you just. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't. no, I do, I I do, I, I am, a, I am, a, let's say, a little bit sometimes here and there. I get it. No, no, no. You 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 are you you are your own a best storyteller, and I'm telling you, you have so many fans in the desert Southwest. So many people came up to me, like one after the other. I heard you on Savage. It was you guys were great together. Love this. Love the sound. You guys were laughing, having a good time. And, and it reminded me of why I, first of all, I love listening to you, but I also just, I, I value you so much on the airwaves. You're a total original. And I know I sound like I'm sucking up to you, but I don't have any reason to suck up to people anymore. I don't suck up to you. I never really did. But you're an original, and you, you know how to do what so few, sadly, conservatives know how to do well, is to speak in stories. It, it, the Bible is filled with parables. We need more storytellers. Other, otherwise, we're going to lose our story. We're not going to have our own story to write anymore. Uh, so. Well, the truth is that the truth is that the Bible is a book of stories, and it was written by prophets who were uh, storytellers of their time. Okay. Laura, the book is called "Billionaire at the Barricades." What number did it uh, um, come out on the on the bestseller list? What number? It came out. It came out at eight, which ticks me off because we sold eight. I think eighteen thousand. Uh, excuse me, thirteen thousand. Thirteen thousand uh, units moved, and that's really big for you know for the first week out. And I think you know the New York Times has its own very <clears throat> interesting formula. Which yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I hope that your appearances around the country and on this show. We'll move it up on the list for weeks to come, and I look forward to being on your television show uh, on Fox uh, um, Television whenever that happens, Laura. And take care of yourself on the road. Will you do that for me? I can't wait, wait Michael, and uh, I, you're just going to be so much fun to have on the show. I can't wait. Okay, thank you. Laura Ingram, billionaire at the Barricades. I'll be right back. This is Michael Savage. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. the Savage Nation. Uh, we've been having a good time today, I think. Should liberal judges who release criminals be held liable? That was a, it's a big story. Here's a guy arrested 42 times, released by a, another psycho judge in Maryland, one after the other. He goes out yesterday, and he, he shoots three, four, five people. Why is the judge not in prison? What, why, what, what is it? A doctor performs a mistake. He loses his license if it's severe enough. I think judges need to be held liable when they do a thing like this, when they push their agenda like that. We have also talked about the uh, gluten hysteria explained, and I'm not talking about people who are truly celiac, who can get very sick or die from, from gluten. We're talking about the hysteria surrounding gluten. I've been telling you about this for years, for years. It's not even commonsensical. We are also asking should the draft be restored due to all of the tension in the world, and then the death thing. Do you come back from the dead? Uh, it's an interesting, crazy question. One caller on it. Don on WABC Line 5, tell us your story, please. Dr. Savage, I got into a confrontation. This is a dream that I had. I died in a dream. Got into a confrontation with a man who... Wait, wait, uh, I don't need about a dream. I asked you if you actually died and came back from the death. Only in a dream, Dr. Savage. No, I'm not good enough. You're not a talk show host. You don't get to tell us your dreams. Oh, God. Now, let me tell you something. We're talking about crazy stuff today. And what is more essential than protecting your home? Well, nothing. you got to protect your home. That's your castle. 
But getting traditional home security can be a punishing and expensive task. But there's a better way you can protect your home with Simply Safe Home Security. I've told you about it. But ask anyone locked in a long term security contract. They're on the hook for three years, paying $45, $55 a month. Or ask someone who's had a system hardwired into their walls. The installation alone cost them a fortune. Simply Safe got rid of everything that makes home security a hassle. They make it easy for you. Simply Safe has no long term contract, there are no obligations. Your home is protected around the clock with 24-7 professional monitoring. And if there's trouble, they'll send police. And the service costs just $15 a month with Simply Safe. That's three times less than what the other guys charge. No hidden fees. So protect your home today. You can buy Simply Safe at your local Best Buy and have your home protected by tonight. Or go to simplysafesavage.com for a special 10% off. That's simplysafesavage.com for 10% off your system. Simplysafesavage.com. When I come back for hour number three, we'll talk about all the news of the day, news, views, and reviews that you've come to expect on this program, including topics I've not yet gotten to, by the way, right here on The Savage Nation. Join The Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Warning. The Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of borders, language, culture, and here he is, winner of the National Radio Hall of Fame Award, Michael Savage. ideas, shift around, keep you occupied. So um, I started doing Twitter after criticizing the president because I realized if you can't beat him, join him. If it's good enough for him, it's good enough for me. So I really got into the tweeting thing, and I found something interesting about Twitter, which is that the more trivial the statement or the story, the bigger the response generally. So like I put up Teddy Loves Gluten. I showed him eating a piece of bread last night in a restaurant. I got more reaction to that than I did to the story about uh, Las Vegas. (laughs) But I want to thank all of you who've gone on to my Twitter feed to help the Highway Patrol families devastated by the fires and to help that other family of children who lost their house. It's been so important that you did that. And believe me, the Highway Patrol knows that you're helping them. I was at a mall last night after the show yesterday afternoon, and they were, you know, gathering things, clothing and groceries for those victims of the fire, real victims as opposed to fake victims in America. And there were CHP officers there. We had a wonderful meeting, took a picture with them, which I'll post one of these days. But those of you into cars, I know I'm jumping around now. You know, I have, I have two old Jaguars that I drive. I keep them in a garage really, but they're, they're, they're my, like a hobby of mine. They occupy my mind during downtime. So one of them is a 1970 XK. There was nothing really wrong with it. And like an idiot, I uh, realized to not leave well enough alone. My father, I heard him come back from the grave and say, what are you doing? You know, if it's not broken, don't fix it. Well, anyway, I said, you know what? The car runs well, but I hear that there's only 20% friction left on the plate, on, on the clutch. I may as well do it now. So British engineering being what it was in those days, you have to remove the engine and transmission to put in the clutch in this XK. It's really a modified DJAG racing car, which is why I always loved it. All right, so here's the story. If you want to see the car uh, taken apart, it's up on Twitter, Jag Torn Down. There's the timing change chains. There's the clutch on the floor. There's the transmission torn apart. There's my mechanic, Justin, smiling. I wonder why he's smiling so much. I hope he can get, put it back together again. Uh, so we're looking at that. That's a fun thing for me to do. It's a hobby. Everyone needs a hobby, don't they? And then we're talking about horrible news out there, dying and coming back from the dead, George Bush, this and that. 
who do you believe with the, uh, the the widow thing? We found out that it was a complete fabrication by the anti-Trump uh, cowboy hat wearing uh, whatever. I don't know, congresswoman, whatever. It turns out she's an embarrassment to the Congress for what she did to Trump, horning in on a gold star call like that. But it shows you there's no bottom to how far the, de- the Dems will go to uh, make a political point. It's sickening. And uh, General Kelly's statement today was heartbreaking. You know, General Kelly is a great former Marine general. I guess former general doesn't work. He is a general. He was chief, he is chief of staff to Donald Trump. He is the gatekeeper. And he gave the ultimate to this nation. His son, his proud, heroic son, lost his life or gave his life for this nation in Afghanistan. I realize that means a lot to certain people. And it was touching to listen to General Kelly today as he commented upon this goofball, hat-wearing, anti-American congresswoman from Florida. And you got to hear General Kelly right now to hear what the, the right stuff sounds like. We don't hear it enough. And after eight years of Hussein, we didn't hear it at all. But listen to General Kelly one more time, Robert, if you could, if you could pull that speech. It was so touching and so classy. You know, at the one hand, it's heartbreaking. On the other hand, it gives you faith in America that there are men like this still left in politics. And thank God he's working for... Uh, for for President Trump. Let's hear General Kelly. It stuns me that a member of Congress would have listened in on that conversation. Absolutely stuns me. And I thought at least that was sacred. You know, when I was a kid growing up, a lot of things were sacred in our country. Women were sacred and looked upon with great honor. That's obviously not the case anymore as we see from recent cases. Life, the dignity of life, was sacred. That's gone. Religion, that seems to be gone as well. Gold Star families, I think that left in the convention over the summer. But I just thought the selfless devotion that brings a man or woman to die on the battlefield, I just thought that that might be sacred. And when I listened to this woman and what she was saying and what she was doing on TV, the only thing I could do to collect my thoughts was to go and walk among the finest men and women on this earth. And you can always find them because they're in Arlington National Cemetery. God in heaven, thank God we have him. Just thank God that the best are still around in this country after eight years of seeing the other types uh, in in Hussein's uh, orbit. John Francis Kelly was born May 11th, 1950, chief of staff for President Trump. He uh, previously served as U.S. Secretary of Homeland Security. Now, who is he? He's the right stuff. He is a retired United States Marine Corps general, a real one as opposed to the fake ones pushed forward by Obama, such as women who never flew or running the Air Force, women who never drove a powerboat who are secretaries of the Navy. He is an actual former commander of the United States Southern Command and the Unified Combatant Command, and he was responsible for American military operations in Central America, South America, and the Caribbean. I mean, this is really an amazing man. And he was, he's now the gatekeeper, as we know, White House Chief of Staff. I was interested in where he was born. Irish Catholic, Boston, 1950. Grew up in the Brighton neighborhood of Boston. And he was a wild kid. Before he reached the age of 16, General Kelly hitchhiked to Washington State And he rode the rails, including a freight hop from Seattle to Chicago. So he was a a wild kid looking for direction. He then served for one year in the United States Merchant Marine, where he says, quote, my first time overseas was taking 10,000 tons of beer to Vietnam. In 1970, when his mother told him that his draft number was coming up, General Kelly enlisted in the U.S. Marine Corps. And uh, he uh, was discharged from active duty as a sergeant in 1972, after serving in an infantry company with the 2nd Marine Division of Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, he was commissioned on December 27, 1975, as a second Louis in the Marine Corps VO Officer Candidate School. And he went on in school. He got a Master's of Arts in National Security from Georgetown. In 1995, Kelly graduated from the National Defense University of Washington, D.C., with a Master of Science in Strategic Studies. Now, He was a rifle platoon, a weapons platoon commander in the 2nd Marine Division, by the way. And he's he's got a very distinguished career. 
And as I say, he gave the most a man could give to this country, his son. His son followed in his father's footsteps and died in Afghanistan. So he knows what he's talking about. He could have been bitter in his speech about that crazy fool in the straw hat. But he wasn't bitter. He was just classy, something that we have long needed in the United States of America. So thank you, General Kelly, for the gift of your service in the White House and the gift of your wonderful son uh, in defense of liberty. I don't know what else to say. Now, talking about a sad story like that brings us back to the question that I had on the uh, show earlier, which is I uh, was reading that when after you die, your brain stays alive for a certain period of time, which is freaky to me. I don't know how that's even possible, you know. So I ask people to call if they actually, if they think they died and came back. Let's hear what they have to say. Eric on WABC, the... Okay, we're batting a thousand. One thing I love about my show is the coordination, the timing. It's wonderful. Let's try another one. KSFO, Philip, tell us your story. Go ahead, please. Yes, doctor. Retired school teacher, shot in the head in the schoolyard, 1979, taken to the trauma center. Saw my, saw my body laying on a gurney. I had to be above my body. My consciousness was above my body. Then I saw a black tunnel and a little speck of light at the end of a black tunnel. I got drawn into the light. When I came into the light, I was at one with the universe. The stars, every molecule of my body seemed to be at one with the universe. I didn't have to ask the question why about anything. It was just complete understanding because I was part of everything. And uh, then I saw a green hedge. And standing behind the green hedge was my beautiful favorite grandfather, Joe. And I went over to Joe and I, uh, my grandfather, no, no, Joe. And I says, I love it here. I want to stay. I don't want to go back. And he says, you can't stay. I says, who says I can't stay? He says, that guy over there. And I looked mm. over there, and it was somebody that looked like Jesus Christ. And as soon as that happened, I smelled something sweet. Now, mind you, you're in heaven, and there's no, sense, no senses at all. And, and when I smelled something sweet, I get drawn back down through the tunnel and into my body. And when I open my eyes, I see a, a white square on the collar of a Roman Catholic priest. And guess what he's doing? He's putting sweet rose oil under my nose. And I said, you SOB, why'd you bring me back? And he laughed and said, that's what they all say. Isn't that amazing? Philip, that's an astounding story, and I, I believe every word you told me. Pittston Area School District, Martin L. Mate Middle School. 19- but who, sh- why, who shot you? What, what was that? Who were you? Shot in the head by who? Well... Uh, there was something called the Barnum site where federal, where, where they put these trailers after floods. And, uh, and guys are, we used to go up there uh, with shotguns and hunt bunny rabbits. But there was um, some, a couple of guys up there with uh, 225 high-velocity straight trajectory rifles. And the bullet came tumbling down out of the sky and went in my head. And I oh, my God. So, so ob- obviously you're a true believer in heaven, correct? I don't even know if David caught the ball. All but, I- Philip, 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 hold on. Phil, hold on. You actually believe in heaven, correct? Oh, yeah, definitely. I definitely believe in life after death. Well, you got me convinced. Absolutely. Well, I'm going to send you God, Faith, and Reason, which is only a book, but it talks about all these things in my own way. Thank God I've never experience what you experienced, maybe in a minor way. I mean, sometimes I don't know, really. I know I was hit by a car once and was bounced off a fender in Jamaica, Long Island. And to this day, I don't know what really came of me. Sometimes I think it's all been a dream. Uh, since then, one other time, a little close call, but nothing like you, nothing as dramatic as that. Philip, stay on the line. We'll send you that book. Well, we're running short of time on the Savage Nation. I suppose we're going into the um, twilight zone now, and we will continue to do so and take all of the news reviews that you're used to right here on the program. Be here. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. 
Like a phoenix, I rise from the ashes virtually every morning, by the way. Each day is a renewal to be, uh, if you're, you're kind of a natural person, each day is a renewal. You understand that that's all true. If you're not really tied into your body, if you're not really connected to reality, if you're not really connected to God, I think people just kind of stumble through life. They don't even know that they're alive. Did they know the difference between consciousness and and unconsciousness, life and death, I can't speak for the next person. It's just one man going through it, walking walking the uh, the plank with all, with all of you. How do I got into this is funny. I mean, died and came back. It's, you know, does it really belong in talk radio? Why not? Why does it have to be Democrat and Republican with Newt Gingrich as a special guest? I, I'd rather not do that if you don't mind. By the way, speaking of Newt Gingrich, his lovely wife Callista, the trombone player, is... Uh, was officially appointed to the Vatican as a U.S. ambassador. I don't understand that at all. What does she do, play the trombone for the Pope? I have no idea. What does a U.S. ambassador to the Vatican do? Can you imagine having to meet those guys in those vestments all day long in that creepy place? I don't know. I don't know why anyone would want that job. Maybe she's very devout and she feels by meeting the uh, the Pope uh, she'll get closer to God. I don't really know. I, I don't know how people can get fall for this malarkey. What do you mean he's the son of God? The Pope is the son of God? He was a bouncer in, in, in South America when he was young. A brutish guy who beat people up in a bar. And then, like the character in The Red and the Black, the great French novel of the 19th century, he realized there were two ways to move up in society in his time, either by wearing the red of the army or the black of the uh, priesthood. So he chose the black. And look how far he's gotten. But it doesn't mean he's particularly different than you and I, does it? This is what I don't understand why people get into this worship of man or religion. I, you know, when it comes right down to it, here I am writing a book that's coming out, God, Faith, and Reason. You want me to fake this book? I'm not faking it. I don't really believe in organized religion, to be honest with you. I don't think I ever have. Every time I've gone into one of these places, I, you know, sometimes you feel it, sometimes you don't, but I don't believe in organized religion. I personally just believe in God because I have the faith to believe in God. I was raised to believe in God, and I live as though God is real and God exists, and I'll meet him at the end of the road, if I'm lucky. If not, God knows who I'm going to meet, and boy, I know all my old friends will be there. That's the terrible news about that one. I mean, what if I meet the other guy? And, uh, well, like the Irish say, well, what are you worried about? If you do, all your, all your friends will be there waiting for you, so what's the difference? It's a funny thing. Remember I told you about that Irish linen I once had? I wish I could find that. That is in a suitcase somewhere. Uh, what's there to worry about? It was like, don't worry, with an Irishman on it. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? By the way, I have a question for you. Would you tweet me if you know where I can go in the East Coast in the next week to see the changing leaves? Is it too early or too late? Where should I go to see the changing leaves? I don't want to miss one more autumn changing of the leaves while I'm still on the earth. That's one of God's greatest gifts to mankind is the autumn leaves of the East Coast. We have them here in California at about three, 4,000 feet. But it's not quite the same as the showy leaves of, uh, you know, N Vermont, for example. But since uh, Bernie Sanders is from that state, I don't want to go to Vermont to even see the leaves or buy the maple syrup. Is there anyone listening to the show who can tweet me or such? You can reach me on Facebook or Twitter and tell me where to go to see the changing of the leaves. I want to stay like in an inn, like a revolutionary era inn that's been renovated with a good mattress, and, a, and I, it must have cable TV or I'm not going. Because after the leaves are over at night, what am I going to do at night? I have to have shows. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. It is the Savage Nation. Should the draft be reinstituted in the United States of America? I mean, we're basing it upon the 
religious Jews who don't want to serve in the Israeli military, even though U.S. Supreme Court, in, I'm sorry, the Israeli Supreme Court ruled this year saying they had to serve. Well, now they're rioting in Israel. Oy vey, why do we have to serve? Religious Jews. Come on. It wasn't the Torah that saved your ancestors. It was a Thompson submachine gun and a Sherman tank. And let me tell you something else, all you phonies out there who hide behind your, your Bibles. You want someone else to die so you could go re- read a Torah somewhere? The most religious Jews in Israel also served in the military. I remember the time, by the way, that a famous chief rabbi of Israel, the chief rabbi of Israel, was a paratrooper. He wasn't afraid to fly with an Uzi in one hand and a Bible in the other. So stop hiding behind the Torah and saying you're so much better than everybody else. I'm sick of it. And the same thing goes on here. They're too good to do this. They're too good to do that. Let me tell you something else that you may have forgotten from your own religious teachings. Your own religious teachings teach you that a man should have a trade or an occupation for half the day and engage in religious studies the other half of the day. No one ever said you should be... Ex- uh, let us removed completely from the real world because if you are you wind up removed from the real world you don't know what you're talking about how many poor jews went into the ovens holding on to their precious torahs how many went into the ovens after their wives were killed in front of their eyes because they had no guns and if they had a gun they wouldn't know how to use it what did they say they're too good to use a gun i'm sorry it doesn't hold water i agree a thousand percent with the israeli supreme court and you should force them into the military. It's that simple. Now it comes to America, the same story. A lot of people don't want to go in the military. Only people who want to go in the military are the people that Ellen DeGeneres, Rachel Madcow, and people like that hate. They put them down every day, one way or the other. The rednecks, in other words. The rednecks are the, are the heart and soul of America. They're the spine of America. Headline, AFP, hardline religious Jews protest against Israeli army service. Several thousand ultra-Orthodox Jews blocked a major intersection in central Jerusalem on Thursday to protest against efforts to force the religious Jews to enlist in the Israeli military like their secular compatriots. Now, let me explain something to you. If it wasn't for the military, there would be no Jews in Israel. Let's start with that. And for them to hide behind their religion and say that, how dare you tell us to serve in the military because we are engaged in religious study. Well, excuse me, you think the people in the military aren't engaged in their lives as well? So in other words, ultra-Orthodox young men are hiding behind their religion to dodge military service. More than 100 have been detained over the recent demonstrations, including 70 ultra-Orthodox this week, blocking roads, sitting sitting in the middle of the street. One of them had a sign that said, to a military prison for the crime of Torah study. One man who's a draft dodger in black robes and payas says, the state wants to silence all the Jews who want to study Torah. He said, lately they have have seen the ultra-Orthodox population growing, so they want us to serve in the army and be absorbed into the general population. Well, my friends, I have a question for you. You see, in Israel there's a law, and it requires men to serve two years and eight months in the military on reaching the age of 18, while all Israeli women must serve for two years. But ultra-religious men are exempt from military service if they're engaged in religious study. Mm -hmm. Religious study. Well, every Orthodox Jew is engaged in religious study because they read the Bible every day. So what, they get a pass? It's like people with disability placards on their cars in San Francisco. What, do you think they're all disabled? Are you joking? How many people have you seen jump out of cars in in your town, hopping into into the IHOP, who have absolutely no disabilities whatsoever, and they use the blue card that was put aside, that space, for the really crippled. I can ask you a question about Israel, but I'm not going to. I'm jumping to America. And here's my question for America. And you ready for it? Should the draft be restored in America due to all of the tensions in the world? I think it's an important question because I believe it's going to happen anyway. And the problem is when the millennials are drafted, and they're told to get up 5 o'clock in the morning uh, at Reveille, and they're sucking their thumb, and they have no iPhone, what are they do, cry in their beds and call their mother and say that they need a lawyer because they've been told to get up when they're not feeling well, that their safe space has been violated by the drill sergeant, that they don't feel good that morning, they don't want to go up on the, on the parade ground there. I'm telling you right now, unless we start 
training people through a draft, a compulsory draft. I don't know how we could ever fight and win a war again. I have no idea. Now, faced off against China, are you joking? Are you kidding me? Other than the very rednecks that the left hates, this country could be overrun in about three hours, by the way. Did you hear what I just said? Other than the white people and the black people who are in the military and the Hispanic hard guys who are in the military, this country can be overrun in three hours. Those are the very people that the liberals detest. They hate them. They call them every name under the sun. Even if they're not white, they're called terrible names because they're in the military. And I'm asking a very important question. Should the military be restored in the United States owing to the tensions in the world and the coming wars? Should liberal judges who release criminals be held liable? So we need now to understand that China is threatening us. There are continuously growing threats in the Middle East, in case you haven't noticed. Maybe you have a wig on your mind and you don't really know what's going on. Maybe you're still listening to Mr. Ha Ha. Maybe it's all Ha Ha Ho Ho. Or maybe you still have your hat on backwards watching the idiots in the football game. Do you know what's really going on in the world? Do you know that the radical Islamic movement is getting stronger, not weaker? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. They were finally driven out of uh, the areas of Iraq and Syria thanks to the Russian Air Force. I know I'm not supposed to say that, but for eight years, your friend, your hero, Barack Hussein Obama made believe he was fighting ISIS. He was not fighting ISIS. Everybody knows that. It was only when Trump came along and only when the Russian military started to bomb the Russian Air Force that the tide was turned. And yet the Libs want war with Russia because they're a fifth column. The liberal establishment is actually the fifth column. Fifth column, not the fourth estate. The news is so depressing. The country is, is in such a, such a gr grave state of shock. The only thing good is the stock market, and I don't have a dollar invested. I don't know about you. I'm not an investor because I know the system is gamed. I believe the stock market is as rigged as the Academy Awards are, and only the insiders get what they get, and it's done for favors, as we well know. So I have no money in the stock market. Or to my loss, I know that. People have made fortune upon fortunes in the last uh, year since Trump, uh, almost a year now since Trump became president. The market's booming. Good luck to that one. But you know, my friends, everything that goes up must come down. It's inevitable. It will crash. No one knows when. People keep throwing money at the wheel of fortune called Wall Street, hoping they're the last ones not the last ones in, and I certainly don't want to be the last one in because I'll tell you right now, those who control the game are the ones who are going to control the game. They'll sell short while you've gone long, and you'll wind up with the short end of the stick. And so if you're in the market and making money, I'm happy for you, but all I can say is everything that goes up must come down. So where does that leave us today? Where does it leave us when we don't know which way to turn? A lot of people I know are very upset with the state of affairs. They're terrified there's going to be a nuclear war. They don't understand why fires keep breaking out in California. Things are not looking too good. The FBI and the Las Vegas Police Department keep changing their story. The sheriff who gives his uh, delivery on what happened changes the timeline and then increasingly it looks like he's freaking out and sweating. The whole world looks at this, including people who were escapees of the Vegas massacre, who are reporting different stories in the government is reporting. The people are frightened. They feel everything is out of control, and they really don't know who's running things. And, uh, you know, it comes back again to the president. I've got to read you something from the cover of Trump's war. Uh, the fact of the matter is he promised a lot, and I said, well, if we get 40% of what he promised, then 30%, then 20%, then 10%. Right now we're at about, uh, uh, we're ranging between a 5 and a 6% of what he promised. So I wrote Trump's war soon after Trump was inaugurated. I'm not going to read it to you. Many of you can read it yourself. But I want you to hear what I wrote for the first paragraph on the book jacket of Trump's war. By the way, it became number one on the New York Times bestseller list, which is very important for you to know because I was not on any television shows and on no other, quote, conservative talk radio shows, with the exception of Laura Ingram, who is absolutely the queen of all talk radio. All the others are too busy promoting themselves to ever promote Michael Savage, but I did very well without them. They'll soon find that they need me more than I need them. But the first paragraph of Trump's war begins like this, at least the book jacket. It says this, 
Listen carefully and tell me which he has delivered on. The wall, zero. Taxes, zero. Tariffs, zero. Deportations, yes, he is deporting. Obamacare, zero. Guns, thank God he hasn't touched them yet. But, but after the Vegas massacre, the president said, we'll revisit guns, so we don't know where he is on that. Military strength, he gets 100% on that. It's gone way up. Schools, he's left them alone. Give him 100% on that. Abortion, zero. He's done nothing to stop uh, Planned Parenthood. They haven't been put out of business yet. Religion, he hasn't touched that. I think that we give him a plus on that one. And I ask, what will the new president do? In this book, the man who many consider to be the determining factor in driving Trump over the finish line by motivating millions of undecideds and the deplorables who would have otherwise sat out the election provides a crucial first look at the early direction of the Trump presidency. Now, I want you to pay close attention to what I'm about to read to you if you think I was deluded and fooled. Here is what the book promised. It said, The president faces relentless opposition from special interests in both parties who stand to lose trillions if Trump's America First policies become the law of the land. Not only will Trump have to overcome progressive ideologues, neoconservative ventriloquists, hello, connected corporate interests, and a military-industrial complex bent on permanent war, Trump will also have to fight progressive beliefs. Even he and his otherwise conservative appointees have unwittingly accepted. That's a complicated sentence. I'll read it again. I predicted this. I said Trump will also have to fight progressive beliefs. Even he and his otherwise conservative appointees have unwittingly accepted, and I rest my case. The fact of the matter is I'm not surprised that we've not gotten so much yet. We've gotten some. And I guess we could always do the default mechanism and say, well, it's better that Hillary wasn't elected. And it surely is because to not just to have to not hear her lambast white males, lambast uh, America is worth it to me. So on that level alone, I'm still hopeful that he will do the right thing. I don't know that he'll get a lot done. The fact of the matter is I'm not shocked, and I'll, say, I'll tell you something I wrote in my own journal when I was 18 years old, if you think I'm a neophyte to this business of politics. I've been political a very long time, but I've never gone into politics because I always felt liars were all thieves and liars and, uh, frankly, just actors. And I wrote in my journal when I was 18, when I really became aware of the whole structure, I said to myself, the American president, the president of the United States, whoever it may be, is really just a figurehead. The president is very much like the Queen of England. They ultimately have no power. All they do is have the power of public opinion. That's all they have. I wrote that when I was 18. Has anything really changed? I don't care who the president is. Do they really have ultimate power? Well, I, they do. They can spare you from a death sentence. They can condemn you to death. They can command a war. They can start a war. They can end a war. I get that. They are the most powerful people on earth. But at the end of the day, do you really think that they have power over the daily goings-on in our country? I think that they're truly just figureheads. So where does that leave us? Where does it leave a natural man like me when I realize once again that, no, I have not been duped. I just had an awful lot of hope and faith uh, that Donald Trump would make a big difference, and maybe eventually he will. But I personally feel we're going to get a tax increase, not a tax decrease. You can write that down. Oh, we'll have a tax overhaul for sure. But I can guarantee you my taxes are going to go up, not down. So where does it leave me? Where does it leave me? With my cynicism intact. Be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. Here's a guy, the guy who shot uh, how many people? Six people in Maryland. Oh, you didn't see that one? I'm sorry. He didn't look like Timothy McVeigh. Right, right. Didn't make it to the newspapers. Uh, after a 10-hour manhunt across state lines, authorities apprehended a man who shot six people in Maryland Wednesday, killing three. Radi Labib, Prince, was arrested Wednesday evening near a high school in Newark, Delaware. 
Now, if you read the story, you'll find out that Mr. Prince is not such a prince of a man. He had been arrested 42 times in Delaware. He was fired from a job earlier this year after punching a co-worker. A former employer tried to get a restraining order against Mr. Prince after he cursed and yelled at his boss, and everyone felt threatened. So Prince now goes on a shooting spree, even though he had been arrested 42 times in Delaware, which leads me to a big question today, which is should liberal judges who release felons who commit crimes, should the judges be held liable? Of course they should be. If a doctor, a surgeon, performs surgery, well, why do I have to say surgeon today? If a doctor does anything today, he's sued. People sue them for nothing. Uh, you went in for a headache and you didn't fix the headache, therefore you're a bad doctor. But let's make it more graphic. You go in for surgery and they cut the wrong artery or a vein and you have a, a problem, you sue the doctor. Malpractice, right? Sometimes a surgeon loses his license. Why shouldn't a judge be sued? Why should they be above the law? Who wrote that law? Why they wrote it. What is a judge but a lawyer who's politically oriented, who uses his cunning and his con to become a judge? How do you think they become judges? Because they're such brilliant jurists? So why should a judge be above the law? That's all I'm asking you. Of course liberal judges who release criminals should be held liable. I'm asking you a rhetorical question. That's all. Should liberal judges who release criminals be held liable? Uh, duh, yes. Can they be? Never. Because they write the laws. That's why they're judges. Should the draft be restored due to all the tension in the world? Uh, yes. Will it be? I don't know. Can it be in this political climate with all the hysterical uh, leftists out there who would say that they need a safe space and the mean drill sergeant told them to do something like get up in the morning and take a shower, cut their hair, take the nose ring out of their nose, call the ACLU? Why don't you just create an entire brigade of... Um, millennial snowflakes and put them on the front lines and let them run the war the way they want. Yeah, right. Okay. It's no joke because this is going to happen anyway. Savage.